If you Google secondary dominance and look at the Wikipedia page that comes up, the definition is confusing, there's a lot of technical terms, and it doesn't really seem to get to the main point. Which is a shame, because secondary dominance are a really useful tool in your harmonic toolkit. They can give your music a feeling of lift and forward momentum, and make your writing more colorful and sophisticated sounding. They're one of the first steps people usually take when they're ready to get beyond regular diatonic harmony. So in this video, I'm going to show you that secondary dominance can be easy to understand, and how to use them in your own music. So let's go. Hey guys, I'm Ryan and welcome to my channel. I'm a composer for film, TV, and media, and I love to figure out and talk about the way that music works. In this video, I'll talk about what secondary dominants are, how you come up with them, and we'll listen to examples from real music. If you feel pretty comfortable with basic diatonic harmony, and you understand what I mean if I say something like the five chord in D major, then you should be good here. If what I just said doesn't really make any sense, then maybe go brush up on your basic harmony and come back here, things will make a lot more sense. So before we talk about what a secondary dominant is, let's review what a dominant is which is basically the five chord in your key. If you're in the key of C major, you have C as your one chord or your tonic. You go to G, which is the five, and you can go back to one. That one, five, one is a tonic, dominant, tonic progression. So a secondary dominant is a dominant chord that has a secondary role. It goes to any chord other than your one chord, other than your tonic. It could be to two, it could be to flat three. As long as you're not going to one, we're gonna consider it a secondary dominant. So think of your tonic as like the center of a solar system. Your one chord is the star or the sun right in the middle, and it has very strong gravity. All these planets going around it are these other chords that pull into that gravity. Some chords have a stronger pull, some a weaker pull, but they all orbit around that one chord, which is home. But if you zoom in on one of those planets, it has its own center of gravity. It has moons circling around it. So in the same way, a chord from in your key can also have its own center of gravity and other chords can want to gravitate to that chord. So if your key is C major and one of your chords is D minor orbiting around it, we can zoom in on that planet, that D minor, we can get the five chord. So in this case, it's A7. So A7 to D minor is a five one progression on that planet gravity level. Now we can take that unit, zoom back out to the solar system and use that five one from the planet level gravity in the context of the whole solar system. So for example, if we have the chord progression C, D minor, G, C, So we can take that two chord, the D minor, remember that it has its own gravity and take its own five chord to resolve to it. So we could have C, A7, D minor, G, C. Here how the A7 has this gravitational pull into the D minor. That C sharp from the A7 really wants to lead in to the D. It has very strong upward movement. And part of the way that secondary dominants work is that they kind of make sense after you hear them, after they resolve. So when it first appears, it's this bright, fresh, new color. And then when it resolves to its tonic afterwards, it makes sense. And you're like, oh, okay. Now I understand where this random A7 came from. It's a chord that's kind of surprising when it first appears and then explains itself afterwards. So because the secondary dominant is the five chord of whatever key it's coming from, we call it the five of whatever. So the five of two or the five of five, and that's usually written as a five slash target. So I think this will all start to make a lot more sense as we go through and listen to some real musical examples. We'll go through the secondary dominant of every diatonic chord, except for the diminished seven, and by the end of it, I think you should be getting the hang of it. So for the first example of a five of two, let's listen to Kakariko Village from the Legend of Zelda series. So the secondary dominant is happening here on this G to the C minor, measures 12 to 13. C minor is the two chord in B flat. So if we go into the key of C minor, we think what is the five chord here? The five chord to C is G. So we're using that C as the gravitational pull and the five chord pulling into that C minor and putting it into the context of B flat. Mm -hmm. 
And then he just proceeds to go on with diatonic harmony from there. So what the G does really nicely here is kind of pulls us into that C minor at the end, which gives us this forward momentum towards his final cadence. It also does a nice job of accenting the minor quality of that C minor, which I think gives it a whimsical touch at the end there. So what we have at the very end is... Also notice because of the B natural in the G minor, we get this rising chromatic line. And you'll find that a lot with these secondary dominants is you can end up with a very nice chromatic line between your chords. So the next example of five of two comes from Maxwell Silverhammer. So in the key of D, the two chord is E minor. The five chord in E minor is B or B7. So the progression we're pulling out is that B7 to E minor. And we're putting it in the context of D major. If you tried to use the B minor here, which is the six of the key, it wouldn't really work because you have that C natural in the melody, and that would create a flat nine over a minor chord, which is just kind of a nasty sound. But by putting it under a dominant chord, you get this dominant flat nine, which is more of kind of an edgy altered sound. So the flat nine on the minor versus the flat nine on the dominant seven. And then that C natural goes nicely down into the B of the E minor chord and the D sharp of the B7 goes nicely up. So we get that. So there's this really big tension in beat four of that chord that resolves nicely into the E minor. Again, that whole thing has this kind of forward lift into measure three. Now let's take a look at an example of the five of three. I was able to find one in Bohemian Rhapsody. I apologize for how the MIDI just does not live up to the Queen recording, but I don't want to get a copyright takedown notice. So we're in the key of E flat. The three chord is G minor. And in the world of G minor, the gravity of the five chord is D or D7. So we're gonna pull that out of G minor, put it into E flat. On its own, if we just do E flat, D, G minor, we would get. Which, if we just stop there, actually feels very conclusive. Because the E flat is the flat six chord of G minor, it does kind of make the gravity seem like it was inevitable towards G minor. It's only when we keep going that we feel like we're still in E flat. So let's take a listen to that. So what I think the secondary dominant is really doing for us there by pulling us into the G minor is taking us out of the pattern and the busyness of everything that's come before it. This is very much near the end of this crazy solo. It's been huge high energy. We're trying to reach a point where we calm down and that D pulling us into the G minor as a settling down point, I think really helps do that. Also as a bonus, we got that five of two when we have the G7 over B going to the C minor in measures four and five. So the five of four is an interesting one because it's the only of the main diatonic secondary dominant chords that uses a flat instead of a sharp. All the other secondary dominants have this very lifting, sharp forward quality. The five of four kind of has the opposite. It has a very downward settling quality. So here in the key of B flat, the four chord is E flat and the five of E flat is B flat, which can be a little confusing. The only way to really make it work is to make sure you're doing B flat seven because it's that seventh that's gonna sound different to our ear and actually pull that gravity into the four chord. So we have the one, five of four, going to the four chord. So let's take a listen to Let's Fly a Kite. Notice how he uses that B flat seven as a turnaround chord at the cadence to bring us back to the beginning of the phrase. It's kind of unusual to use the four chord at the start of your phrase. So here they're using that five of four as a way to still give us that dominant to tonic kind of relationship kind of feeling from the end of the phrase into the beginning of the next one. So again, it's really important to notice here how the A flat in that B flat seven chord descends down into the G, into the third of the E flat chord. We get that. 
on its own, out of context, it feels like we're in the key of E flat. It's only with everything else going around it that shows us where the real gravity is. So the next example of a five of four is from Hare Hare Yukai from an anime. If you ever listen to any anime music, you'll know that secondary dominants are like a feature of that style. They are constantly using these secondary dominants to pull you to different places throughout the tune. I don't know why that is exactly. It might be because those songs are so high energy and the secondary dominants kind of keep pulling you forward to different places but it is definitely a characteristic sound of that style. So a few things to notice before we listen to this, we do have that five of six happening with the A7 to D minor. And then at the end of bar four into bar five, we have the five of four, the F7 going into the B flat. And as a bonus thing, each of those secondary dominants also brought the two chord with it as well. So in D minor, a two, five, one is E minor, A7, D minor. In B flat, the two, five, one is C minor, F7, B flat. So instead of just bringing in that five chord, they brought the whole two, five, one progression with them. So let's take a listen. So this harmonization is full of chromatic tones and borrowed chords from different keys, but notice when they're used. It's always in a point of motion in the phrase. The beginning of the phrase is actually always a solid diatonic chord. So the first two bar phrase, we start on the F. The next two bar phrase, we start on the D minor. The last phrase is four bars long and we start on that B flat. So the F, D minor, and B flat all make perfect sense in the key of F. They're pretty stable points for us to know where our ground is. And all those secondary dominants and more colorful chords are happening when we want some motion, when we want to pull forward into the next phrase. So the next one we have is the five of five, which is probably the most common of the secondary dominants. Here we have the fire emblem theme, which is in the key of F. So the five chord in F is C. The five chord in C is G. We keep moving backwards. So here we're gonna be looking for a G to C to F progression, which is what we have in measures three, four, and five. So let's take a listen. Something interesting about this theme is what's happening in bar seven with that G minor seven to G seven. We're getting the actual two chord in the key of F followed by that altered chord, that secondary dominant to the five chord. So we're ending up with... Again, another one of those chromatic lines happening. Another example of the five of five comes in the B section to Love Me Tender. So we're in the key of G and the five chord is D if we go into the world of D and the gravity around it, it's that A7 to D. So we pull that back out and put it into context and we'll get the A7 to D7 to G. So let's take a listen and then we'll look at a few other things that he's doing here. So this is kind of a packed example as far as secondary dominance are concerned. Right in bar one, we have that five of six, and then in bar two, we get the five of four. And then as this kind of extra thing, he's chained the secondary dominance in that whole last phrase. So if we wanna end on G, we back up the five chord behind it is D. We back up behind that is A. But he actually backs up a step further and we get this whole chain, the E7 to the A7 to the D7 to the G. So there's this kind of tumbling down, constant forward motion to get us to the end. I think this works especially well for the ending of the song because we're getting this forward motion to kind of bring us home, bring us to the end. And all these secondary dominants are kind of pulling us towards that eventual goal. Okay, so the last one I have is a five of six. And we'll look at a whole new world. So in the key of E flat, the sixth chord is C minor. In the world of C minor, like we saw in another piece, G7 is the five chord. So we're looking for that G7 to C minor, which we have in measures five and six. I think what's interesting about how it's placed here is it's another one of those points of forward motion. The theme starts with a two bar phrase that mostly sits around the E flat. That phrase is repeated with some slight variations. It's not until bar five that we get this continuation and we start to roll on forward towards the cadence. This is the point where we want some energy, we want some forward motion, and we wanna kind of drive the theme to the end. So that's where he's using that secondary dominant. That G7 is pulling us into the C minor and giving us that motion. 
So those are all examples of secondary dominance to each diatonic chord. I think I should mention that that Bohemian Rhapsody was the only example I could find of a five of three. If you can find another example of five of three, I'd love for you to leave it in the comments so we can take a listen. The main thing to remember is the idea of the center of gravity, that you can zoom in on a chord and think about if this was the center of gravity, what is the five chord? What chords are pulling me in towards this? Then take that unit, zoom out, and put it into the context of your whole overall key. And remember that you can have these moments of relative gravity that make sense as the piece moves along. So when that secondary dominant first appears and it's kind of this surprising chromatic color, it will explain itself when it properly resolves into the next chord. If you'd like to see more harmony videos like this one, please let me know in the comments what you're looking for. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.